The first concept we're discussing is the concept of quantum vacuum. Uh, and uh, this is um, as close as you get to nothingness in quantum mechanics, emptiness, which is very different to classical vacuum, which really means that there is nothing there. In quantum vacuum, all that's missing are particles, but actually quantum physics says that there is a huge amount of energy stored in this emptiness. Um, basically, you have all possible frequencies which can exist there, and each of these frequencies contains a certain amount of energy. So when you add them all up, in a way, you effectively get an infinite amount of energy. And it's interesting that it's not just a theoretical concept, but you can, you can, you can see the effects of this energy. They're very simple experiments, which we physicists can do to demonstrate that the, the emptiness in, in the quantum sense is not really empty. The key experiment is really on something that's known as the Casimir effect. Um, and the effect is that if you take two conducting plates, so they are like two mirrors which are facing one another, you really make sure that between these plates there is nothing other than the quantum vacuum. So you make sure that the temperature is low enough that you don't excite anything else in between. There is no radiation between the plates. It's really as empty as it can be. And what's interesting is that when you conduct this experiment, these plates start to move towards one another. And in fact, they start to accelerate towards one another, which to a physicist says that there is a force between them. And it's interesting because if you think classically, there is nothing that would actually cause this attraction between them because gravity is far too small to, to be seen at that level. And so the only conclusion that you can draw is that what happens is that as they get closer to one another, the energy, the quantum energy, is getting smaller and smaller. So they, they naturally go towards one another. And this is one of the key experiments demonstrating the existence of the quantum vacuum. So now we understand that nothingness uh, in, in quantum mechanics is already a complex thing uh, and, uh, and, and very interesting. The next level up is to start to introduce particles one by one into the quantum vacuum. So the vacuum is like the basis of everything we do in quantum physics. And now we understand what, what this quantum vacuum really is we can start to make things a little bit more complicated by adding particles into this vacuum. And so that's the next stage. The vacuum consists of infinitely many different frequencies. And each of these frequencies in quantum mechanics corresponds to a different type of particle that you can have. Um, and, and you can think of these frequencies as, as harmonic oscillators, something that vibrates, if you like, like a vibrating string. And when you excite one of these frequencies with a single vibration, that in quantum physics corresponds to a single particle. So we can choose to excite any of these frequencies, and depending on the one that we excite, we will get a different kind of particle. For example, we could get an electron, if you like. We could get a particle of light, a photon. We can get an atom out of it or anything else that we choose to create. Once we now agree that we can create any kind of particle by exciting vibrations in this vacuum within different frequencies, the key property of each of these particles, and that's really something that discriminates quantum mechanics from what we call the classical physics of the macro world, Newtonian physics. The key property is that each of these particles can exist in, a, in many different states at the same time. So this is something we call uh, quantum superposition. So if you take one electron, for, for example, you can have an electron that's located in one special place as well as another one that's a certain distance away and that happens simultaneously at the same time this electron exists in two different places. Uh, in fact, you can make this exist in as many places as you like, you can make it exist in infinitely many places in space uh, and this is what leads to a very interesting interpretation of, of quantum mechanics and a, and a view of quantum mechanics. So this is something that we, will, we would call the many worlds 
interpretation. So you can think of this electron, even though it's just one electron existing in two places, you can think of these two places as two different worlds. So you can think of, of an electron existing in one world where it's located here, and you can think of a parallel world where the same electron is actually located somewhere else. And if you continue to split this electron into more and more locations, you can actually, in principle, have as many parallel worlds, as many parallel universes as you like. Every particle can exist in many different spatial locations at the same time. And quantum mechanics actually says to us that unless we measure where the particle is, all we can say is probabilistically where it might be located if we make that measurement. But unless we do make that measurement physically, the particle literally exists in all of these places at the same time. Now what's interesting is that when you make that measurement, there is a completely random collapse, as we call it, where the particle is suddenly located in one specific physical location. And what's interesting is this, we cannot with certainty predict where this particle will be located. So when we make a measurement, all we can do is give a probability as to where the particle might be located when we, when we execute the measurement. But we can never know that with certainty. So it's interesting that the collapse, as far as we know, is instantaneous. It happens rapidly when you make that measurement and it happens randomly so that you cannot really predict where this particle will, will materialize in the end. So, again, a key distinction between quantum physics and classical physics, and this is something that, that Einstein also complained about a lot because he didn't like this aspect, is that the observer in this case really plays an important role, plays a key role in the measurement process. So in classical physics, the observer is really irrelevant. The observer doesn't change the system by observing the system. But in quantum mechanics, as I said, before the observation, the system can be everywhere. It's in, a, in this quantum superposition of states. But after the measurement, the observer has actually um, caused this complex state to collapse to a single location. So the role of the observer, the engagement, the interaction with the system is key in quantum mechanics to induce this collapse. Duality is, is actually the language that was, that was used quite a lot in the early days of quantum mechanics when, when people were struggling to understand what this all means. And in fact, uh, the conclusion that they reached is that you can think of every quantum object as a wave when it's in a superposition of states. So basically, you have a probability distribution for this object to exist everywhere, which is a little bit like a, like a water wave, for example, that we are used to. Um, now, what's interesting is that there is a dual side to every quantum object, because once you make that measurement, you've actually eliminated, you've collapsed the wave nature of this object, and you've localized it into a single spatial position, which actually makes it into a particle. And that's this duality between waves and particles is actually the key to understanding quantum mechanics. So somehow, if you don't interact with the system, then you can think of it as wave-like. But if you do interact and you probe it in a specific way, it will become and behave like a particle. So there is an interesting quote from the physicist called uh, Lawrence Bragg, who said, everything in the future is a wave and everything in the past is a particle. The famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle lies behind the fact that so far we talked about particles existing everywhere in space, but it can actually exist everywhere as far as any other property is concerned. So for example, let's take the speed with which the particle is moving. It could simultaneously move at two different speeds, like 10 kilometers an hour and 20 kilometers an hour. And what Heisenberg discovered, and th this is the cornerstone of quantum mechanics, his, his uncertainty principle, he discovered that you can never simultaneously know these two properties that are complementary to one another. So you cannot know the position 
of a particle and at the same time know exactly the speed with which this particle is moving. And this is true for any quantum mechanical object. Now we can actually start to make the picture even more interesting and complicated by adding another particle. Uh, and, and the key idea there is that there are two kinds of particles in this world according to quantum mechanics and they are called fermions and bosons. Uh, so uh, what distinguishes them is how they interact when they come together, how these two particles interact. And the typical experiment is a scattering experiment where you really send two particles towards one another, they collide. And then the question is, what happens after they collide? Do they go together in the same direction? They could go left or right together. Or do they actually separate and go their own independent ways? And the first kind of behavior is the bosonic behavior. So that would be like a particle of light. A photon would be a boson, which means when you, when you have two photons colliding together, they always tend to go together, either in one direction or, or in, a, in another direction. And we call this bunching. They bunch together. If you did the same experiment with fermions, with electrons, for example, that's one example of a fermion, then when you scatter two fermions, they would always go their own separate ways. So this is a key experiment to discriminate the two kinds of particles. We talked about two particles, two bosonic particles, for example, two atoms that like to stick together when you bring them together. They go exactly in the same direction. If you extrapolate this and you continue to bring in more and more bosons together, more and more atoms, what happens is that ultimately they go into exactly the same quantum state. So, so this, is, this is extremely difficult to achieve in practice because you need to cool them down to an extremely low temperature so that they don't move very much. But once you manage to do that, you can have as many as a million bosonic atoms and they will all go into the same identical quantum mechanical superposition, if you like. And, and even though there are million atoms there, they actually now quantum mechanically behave like a single super atom, much larger super atom. And this phenomenon is called Bose condensation. So what's interesting is that, is that we started from, from individual quantum systems which behave quantum mechanically. Now we know that even large collections of atoms, when you put them together in the right state, can actually behave fully quantum mechanically. And this could be up to a billion atoms, if you like. And it's interesting that there is some evidence now experimentally that even organic biomolecules do use quantum mechanics for their own information processing. So we have evidences from two directions. One is from photosynthesis, that, that uh, quantum physics plays a key role in the efficiency. And the other one is in magnetoreception. So how, you know, how do animals tell the direction of the magnetic field? And it seems to us that quantum mechanics is again uh, a key principle that they use. As far as magnetoreception, uh, there were experiments conducting, conducted on a bird called European robin, which migrates from Scandinavia in the winter down to the, to the African uh, plains. And then, of course, it's, it's a long journey that the bird does again six months uh, later. And it's interesting that the bird uses a very specific quantum mechanical effect in order to tell the direction of Earth's magnetic field, which is what it uses to navigate uh, along this uh, journey. Entanglement, uh, according to many people, uh, is actually the key feature of quantum mechanics. So that's really something um, whose analog you cannot find anywhere in classical physics. And it involves two particles again. Uh, these two particles can be in a state which, in which they are separated from one another by a very large distance. Uh, but somehow, mysteriously, they can actually still be extremely correlated in the sense that they know about each other even though they are very far apart. And I can describe an experiment how, how we would actually, how we would test this property of quantum entanglement of two particles. So neither of these particles, according to the superposition in quantum mechanics, would have, we would not know the position of either of these two particles really before we made a measurement. Or we would 
not know the speed at which they are moving. But what's interesting is that as soon as you measure one of the particles, which could be here on Earth, and you know the position of this particle, you will instantaneously know where the other particle is located, let's say on the Moon. So they could be as far apart as that. So you measure one of the particles, you learn one of the properties, you could measure, for example, the speed, and you get 10 kilometers an hour, you instantaneously know that the other particle is also moving at 10 kilometers an hour. And because the effect is immediate, it seems as though it contradicts relativity because it's moving faster than the speed of light. And for that reason, Einstein really did not like it at all. He called quantum entanglement spooky action at a distance. And he tried to argue in many ways against it. But now, after 100 years of having tested this in many different systems, we actually know that the effect is real. For a long time in, in quantum mechanics, um, uh, people actually thought that these uh, quantum effects are only present at very small scales when we are talking about atomic, subatomic particles, you know, photons, things like that, things we cannot see and cannot directly feel. But then Schrodinger came along with his famous example that we now call Schrodinger's cat. And what he said is the following. He said, imagine, imagine you have a quantum object like an atom that you really split into two different locations at the same time. You make a quantum superposition. In one of these locations, the atom actually hits a bottle in which you store poison. And in the other location, nothing interesting happens. The atom just stays there. And within this experiment, you also have a cat that's sitting close to this which actually now Schrodinger says, if the atom goes one way, the poison is released, the cat of course dies as the result, whereas in the other uh, case, the atom doesn't do anything interesting and the cat is still alive. But actually quantum mechanics tells us that the atom simultaneously breaks the bottle and doesn't break the bottle, which actually makes Schrodinger conclude that the cat has got to be dead and alive according to quantum mechanics. And he thought initially this was a bit of a paradox, you know, what, what could this really mean? One way in which we could reconcile these two options is to go back to the many worlds view of quantum mechanics. So actually these two different states which exist simultaneously, you can think of them as existing in two parallel universes. So there is a universe in which the atom goes one way, breaks the bottle, the poison goes out and the cat is dead. And there is another parallel universe in which nothing of that kind actually happens. And that's how we understand Schrodinger's cat at, at present. What's important when it comes to understanding what quantum physics is telling us about the world is that you can think of quantum physics as a kind of information theory. Um, and there are two things you need to be able to do. One thing is that when you describe a physical system, what you are really doing is writing down a catalog of all the information you have about that system. So you say, here is the probability that it's located at A. Here is the probability that it's located at B, at C. Here is the probability that it's moving at 5 kilometers an hour, and so on. And you list all of these properties, which in general, of course, will exist in a superposition. They will exist simultaneously. But basically, quantum mechanically, you will write down a long list of all of these probabilities. So that's point number one. Point number two in quantum mechanics is that you need to know how to change this state, this catalog, as time goes on. So how do you update probabilities? So you can think of it in, in, in the analogy with betting. If you're betting on something now, for example, is it going to rain in half an hour, you will give it certain probabilities. You will say 60% it will rain, 40% it won't rain. But in half an hour, when you look outside and you see that it's sunny, you'll of course start to change your probabilities. And you'll say, oh, it looks like 99% sunny now and only 1% raining. And it's exactly like that in quantum mechanics. You have a current description of your system as information. And then as time goes on, 
you're updating all of these probabilities as to how you should make your predictions about the future behavior. And these are the two key uh, laws of, of quantum mechanics. It's amazing that the teleportation is actually possible according to quantum mechanics, but it's, it's a kind of unusual teleportation that, uh, that I want to briefly describe. Um, we've, we've now agreed that information really is, is the key um, concept when it comes to quantum objects. So we, we're not talking about matter and energy being the most important, but it's really the description of your physical system, which is a catalog of information. So what it means to teleport something is that you take that catalog in, of information and move it from one object to another object a certain distance away. So it's very important to emphasize that you're not moving matter, you're not actually transporting atoms from the Earth to the Moon, you're also not transporting energy or any other property like that from, from the Earth to the Moon. But what you're doing is you're taking that catalog of information, that quantum mechanical description, and you're moving it from one collection of atoms onto another collection of atoms. And the way this is done is through entanglement. So the key thing is to have two entangled objects that are shared between two teleporting stations. So they have to share this prior entanglement and that has to experimentally be established before anything can begin. Then you bring in the third object, which is the one you want to teleport, and you make it interact with one of these entangled systems. And because of the property of entanglement, as they interact, that information is automatically imprinted onto the other object that's entangled to the first one. And that's actually the process we call quantum teleportation. 